watch and learn. Today we have with us Kim Sandberg and I, Christina Whitney. And you just got a new machine. Yeah. And you're probably wondering, what do I do now? Yep. So today's video, we are going to teach you how to clean, maintain, yeah. and just some little tips on your new machine. Yeah, so, absolutely. And congratulations, by the way. I know, on those new machines. We know that this, this time of year, there's always lots of new machines. We figured we'd get a jump on things answering questions, right? Yeah, but it's not just for new owners. No. This no. information is applicable to all machines. Yep. Yep. So it might be a refresher course, it might be brand new, yep. but it's stuff that you need to know to take care of your machine. Exactly, so. exactly. So let's start with the most basic thing. So so when we teach our basic class here in the, the education studio here at Handy Quilter Headquarters, we always start with talking about the frame and what we need to do to keep the frame clean and maintained. So in the back here, Christina's standing back there. I will be Vanna back here. She will can let I have see. a batting scrap for the Yes, you certainly can. Thank you. So okay. we know that you all have lots of batting scraps hanging out around your studio. These are actually the best thing to clean the track with. So you yep. can see here, Christina's just got a scrap of batting and she's cleaning the track. She's really focusing on keeping that black track free of any buildup. And you can see there, look at that. She's got a little smudge there that came off of those tracks. So I like to do this every time before I load a new quilt. Mm -hmm. I just take a couple minutes and give all of my tracks a good cleaning. Um, if you have the loft frame, there's only one track to clean. If you have the studio frame or the gallery frame, you'll notice that there's two strips of that black track on both sides of the little, um, uh, silver track holder, yep. I guess we'll call that. So oh, we need yeah. to clean the front. Yep. And we need to clean the back. The rail, back ones. Both of them. Both of them. Yeah. Look at that. That's disgusting. I know. So do you know what this stuff is? It's isn't it just like built up lint and yes. stuff? Yeah. You're as you're quilting and just being in your sewing yep. room, you're gonna yep. get lint and stuff, and it gets it lands on these tracks and dust, and as the wheels go yep. back and forth it's just compounding that and it you're just getting down. this stuff that yeah. over time it's going to build up and you will notice a difference in the mobility of your machine absolutely uh, we have i've actually had we've had people call in i don't know that it's ever happened to me because i am kind of um very fastidious about keeping my track clean but um people will say it's like i feel like i have a big bump in the middle of my track and sometimes it's just a little spot where there's a bunch of lint that has built up and it, it feels like a little mountain when you're going over it with your machine right yeah and when you're doing like pro stitcher work mm -hmm. you're not going to notice that no, no but if you're doing free motion work yeah. or ruler work is when you really, really are going to notice it because you're trying to stay really precise and if it hits that little piece of lint it's not much but it will make a big change in the yeah. way the machine's moving absolutely so if you're getting those little jogs or jerks or whatever when you're yeah. stitching clean your tracks clean your wheels yeah and make sure there's no thread exactly thread gets wrapped around those wheels and that causes issues too exactly and we'll we'll take a closer look at that in just a second one last thing to note i actually just learned this the thing is we're always learning right um i've had some people ask is it okay to clean those tracks with alcohol or some kind of cleaner the answer is no don't, you don't need to use any kind of cleaner, just use the batting scrap. If you actually, if you use any kind of a cleaner, it can leave behind a residue that can build up and cause exactly the same problem. And if you use alcohol, it can actually dry those tracks out over time, which can cause other issues. So your best bet is that good old scrap of batting. We all have bags of it mm -hmm. hanging around our studios. So just use that to clean the tracks, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Okay, let's talk about the one other track that some of you will have, some of you won't. It's the blue track. It's the track that the post-stitcher motors actually run in. So we'll get a little close-up of it here. And there's a couple of different ways to clean this. So you guys can see the blue track here, right along here. Yep, Christina's hands are right there by it. So, and it has these little grooves in it. And the easiest way to clean this is just to use the little brush that comes with your machine. Or I, when I'm really feeling like doing some heavy duty cleaning, I get out my little handheld vacuum and I just run it right along there. And I vacuum that out because you can actually get lint built up inside those tracks, right, Christina? Mm -hmm. yep. So make sure you keep that clean too. 
the, the, those are the tracks that need to stay clean. Um, you guys will notice here, um, I think you guys can probably, yeah, you can see this right here. My finger, it's a little bit hard to see the differentiation between this, but this is actually the metal plate that's put on the frame if you have the electromagnetic channel locks. You'll also wanna make sure that this is cl kept clean and dust free. Mm -hmm. So once again, just r use your batting scraps to keep that clean. Yeah. So depending on which machine and which frame you have, we'll mm -hmm. determine how many tracks you have, yep. if you've got the electromagnetic mag magnetic magnetic channel, channel locks, <laughs> or if you have the pro stitcher track. So okay. not everybody's machine will look exactly like yeah. this. But you'll have some variation of what yeah. we're showing you here. We have every possible option here. <laughs> so next, let's talk about the wheels. So you just mentioned the wheels, and we need to really make sure that we don't have a thread build up around those wheels. So it's a really good idea to manually inspect the wheels. And then you can actually hold the batting right beside it. Christina can kind of do a little demonstration of this. Do you want the carriage wheels or the machine wheels Let's first? start with the carriage wheels okay. first. Carriage wheels are down, hidden underneath. Exactly. And again, on the studio frames and the gallery frames, they're yeah. gonna have two wheels on the back right, two wheels on the back left, two wheels front, two wheels front. Yeah. So a total of eight wheels on the carriage. Exactly. If you're on the loft frame, it will be four, four wheels. wheels total. Four wheels okay. total, yep. So right here is our wheel. I'm just gonna take my batting scrap and just push it up against that wheel. And I'm just gonna roll the machine back and forth. Uh -huh. And that wheel is turning and I'm cleaning the gook off of it. Yeah. There's that special word that I love to use, gook. Gook, smudge. Smudge. We, we all have our special little terms that we use for it's just the, yep. the lint and um, that really builds up over time. So I would do that on all of the wheels, mm -hmm. front and back, and get them nice and clean. You can also use the brush. I'll hand that over to Christina to just kind of brush right there against those wheels to make sure that they're nice and clean too. And every once in a while, you might get a thread that's kind of wrapped around those wheels a little bit. You can easily just use a pair of tweezers to grab that and pull them off. Um, I actually like to take my pro stitcher carriage maybe once a year or so, and I'll actually have my husband set my help me set my machine over to the side, and I'll turn my carriage over, and it's amazing how much stuff <laughs> gets on there, right? Yeah. And and that's even with cleaning it yep. regularly yep. and keeping yep. all of those threads in the garbage rather than letting them just go yeah. wherever they happen to fly. Absolutely. So just be vigilant of that. Um, if you have a pro stitcher carriage, there's extra gears and stuff under there. You can actually look, Christina can kind of put her hand here to kind of show you guys inside there where um, there's some extra places down there that you can just kind of take a little bit of a look there in between the um, back here, back here in the gears. You can, you can do a little bit of looking back there too, make sure that there aren't any threads caught back there. And then we're looking at the track here that's on the carriage. So this is, the, this is, these are the wheels, sorry. This is the track that the wheels of the machine travel forward and backward on. Once again, you can see she's just using the batting scrap there to clean, um, just rolling the machine in place. And these grooves, uh, these wheels have a small groove down the center of them. So you can see that she's just kind of holding, using her thumbnail to hold that in place to clean inside that groove. Because once again, that's a place that you can get a lot of buildup. Um, using the little brush, once again, can work really great right in that spot. So you wanna keep all of those clean. Now we have one other special set of wheels on all of our machines that have a stitch regulation, right, Christina? Yes. And I think we can get a nice, good, close um, shot of these. It's called the encoder wheel. So we've got the encoder wheel, and it actually, it's a little silver metal wheel, and it's got a, like, it's a rubber or plastic O-ring. Plastic ring around it. O-ring around the outside. Once again, you always want to be sure and check, and make sure that it is free of lint, it's clean, it's making good contact with that track. Um, if that wheel is not moving back and forth, stitch regulation is not working. It's not doing its job. Um, the little ring that goes around the outside of that wheel, when you get your machine, it actually comes with a replacement. Over time, that little rubber wheel, I'm not sure if it's rubber, it's some kind of a plastic. It's black. It's black. <laughs> it dries out over, it can possibly, especially if you happen to live in a drier climate, it can dry out over time and you may need to replace it. That's why an, a replacement one comes. 
Now we have two of these on the machine. So the one you're seeing right now is on the side of the machine. The other one is actually on the back middle of the frame. And Christina's pointing to it right there. It's, it's, it actually makes contact with the silver track on the back, the, actually the black track on the back that's in between the little silver. So you wanna make sure that both of those encoder wheels are making good contact, turning smoothly, don't have any thread built up around them so that we get that nice, beautiful stitch that we love. So anything else on those? Did we, did we cover all that stuff? We got all the thread cleaned off. Yeah. Um, I, I like to also just kind of dust down the yeah, tabletop. Absolutely. Because, it, you know, it might not affect the actual stitching right now, yeah. but that dust is eventually going to end up on my tracks. Exactly. And so if I just keep that table clean, mm -hmm. it looks better. Yeah, if you can write your name in the dust, it's hard to clean. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> right? <laughs> Every once in a while, our, our, uh, our machines here in the studio, we clean them. But sometimes we have a lot of them and sometimes there's one that gets missed. And when you can walk by and swipe your finger, you're like, oh, you yeah, should. that one needs to be clean. Next. We need we need to clean that one next. So we've got that clean. Um, you know, the rest of your frame, just just keep it dusted and clean. I I truly believe the the dustiest room in my house is my quilting studio. What do you think? Always. Always. It's all the lint and everything from all that beautiful fabric and batting. And it's the room you spend the most time in, right? Yeah, exactly. It totally is. If only I could <laughs> quilt and sleep at the same time. I can do pretty much everything else, but yeah. Okay, so let's talk about a couple more things with the frame. So first of all, if you've just gotten a new machine, you may be wondering, how do I put these leaders on? So let's talk about how the leaders are supposed to be loaded here. We'll kind of scoot the machine the down here out of the way. So there's three leaders that you wanna put on. When you have a Studio 2 or a gallery frame, we actually have options of how to load them. So gallery two frame, gallery two frame. Sorry. sorry. Um, we are going to show you for standard view, which means that the side arm right here is in the upper position. So it's just, it's up like this. It's in like a straight position like this right here, which means that my, t um, this is the bar. Sorry, this is the pole that will have my quilt top on it. The one that's closest to me will have my quilt backing on it. Okay, and when we do this, we'll move over this way a little bit so you guys can see this. I actually want my leaders to go into the center here. So if I unroll both of them, they both unroll to the center. Are you gonna do the dance? The dance? Should we do it together? We can do waterfall to the center, Johnny. Waterfall to the center. <laughs> So we want these to waterfall and to attach them, all you have to do, actually I should do the other one because this one stays the same no matter what I'm doing. Um, to attach them, there's just Velcro. You put the Velcro on the poles here and we actually have another video that we did. There's other videos out there, getting started videos and mm -hmm. that walk you through how to put this properly on your pole. But you just use that top edge that's got that Velcro on there, you just Velcro them on. So remember, if you are not if when <laughs> when exactly if you load your quilt you pin it the wrong way or anything like that you can always just un un velcro the leaders and put it back on the right way hey we've got a great promo for you this week we've got leaders bungee grabbers and a bunch of other awesome stuff on sale be sure to check out handyquilter.com or visit your local retailer for more details I think the most common problem that mm -hmm. people have with loading is the back, the yeah. take-up pole, and they put it through over top of this idle pole. The idle pole. It has to be underneath yep. the idle pole. If you do that, un-Velcro it, put it under, and slap it yeah. back on. Exactly. Do no you know? need to unpin. Or move the poles. Or I take the poles off. Lift the poles off and do yes. that. You don't need to do that. Yep. So the the take-up pole here, the, um, the leader's going to go waterfall to the back. Yep. Is that how we're going to say it? Over okay. the top. Over the top to, to the, the back. back, underneath, which creates a straight line between these two poles here. Um, if you're going to load in clear view, let's show you how to do that. So if we come okay. over here to the side arm, so you take the side arm and you just lift up slightly. Okay. 
you lift you lift up slightly and then just let it fall forward and it comes down so it's at this lower angle like this and then this is in clear view i'll do the other side too real quick sometimes it helps to put your foot down on the bottom of the the foot of the frame and i've also noticed that depending on how tightly it's put together sometimes it's yeah. easier to move it in and out yep um, sometimes it doesn't like to stay in standard view mm -hmm. because it's not tight enough. Right. And it likes to fall down into this clear view. Yep. So if you have that issue, just get it tightened up just a little bit. Exactly. Now, when I have my uh, frame set up in clear view, I actually want to change the direction that this leader goes. So once again, this makes it really easy. You just turn it this way and they'll throw it on. And we want to take a second and talk about marking our leaders. Yeah. Um, with the, the clear view, though, notice all three leaders are going the exact same direction. They They're coming over way. the top of the pole yep. and towards the back. That's right. That's so. exactly right. So let's take a minute and talk about your leaders. One of the things you need to do when you first get them is mark them. Yes. And there's a couple different ways to do this. So, Christina, I'm going to hand you this one. Okay. And a marker. We're just going to grab a permanent marker. Okay. How do I find the center? You fold it in half. You put the two ends together and fold it in half. And you want to be sure and do a mark up at the top. And we'll do a, a mark there. Um, I, we do recommend using a color other than black. Sometimes when you do it in black, it's a little harder to find. So I'll just do a mark across there in the red. So you can do that with a marker or there's another way that you can mark your leaders. I'm going to flip it in half the other way so we can mark the other oh, side Oh, well, that's well. a good idea. So sometimes, depending on the way that you're holding the leader, yeah. sometimes you'll see the underside. That's exactly right. So we'll do that there, a mark there, and a mark through there. And why is the center line important? That's how we load the quilts. We always load, we pin in the center and then work our way out so that our quilts will be square and straight. That is important. Now, if the thought of taking a marker to your leaders is just not what you want to do. Here's another way that you can do it. I actually have this one here. I took and just put red thread in my, both the top and the bottom. Oh, and that line's a little wonky there in the center, but um, red thread in the uh, top and bottom of my domestic machine. And I marked my center and I just sewed it right in there. So that's on both sides all the way through and it makes it really easy to always see that center. So you guys can see that nice red line there. So if you'd prefer to mark your leaders that way, you can certainly do that. I'm sure that there's some other creative ways that people have marked them also. I have just always used the Sharpie. Use the Sharpie. I'm sure we could come up with other ideas, but <laughs> the Sharpie works. It um, does. One thing I do want to mention though is, yes, we want the center of the leader so mm -hmm. that we can find the center of our quilt. Yeah. But we also need to find the center of our Poles. Yes. So when you're first setting up your poles, you're going to take a tape measure, measure from the same side mm -hmm. all the way down, find the halfway mark, and do that on all of your poles. I even do it on my idle pole. Yep. And mark that center so that they're all lined up, and that's mm -hmm. where you're going to line your leader up to when you put the leader onto the, the exactly. pole. Exactly. And then you can put the quilt on and keep it all straight. Speaking of, do you want to hand me back that leader? I would love we'll to hand it. you back that leader. We'll go back. We'll, we'll pop it right back on here. Okay. So Are we, we have go our clear view or standard view. Uh, let's go ahead. We can do it in clear view. I think clear view will be just fine for right now. Okay. So right here's my center. And actually the way that we have this um, pole set up a little shorter than normal. So actually the joining point is my center point, but I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of some marker right there yep, this is and I did it frame. be sure to do it on both sides of your velcro because once again depending on which way you're loading it's going to depend on which side of the mark you're seeing yep so then okay I'm putting it on the right way right yep you're putting so, it on the correct way for clear, clear view. view so I'm going to do that right there in the center and then we'll go ahead Make and sure we're going to get questions what is clear view yeah. it's just a different way for the poles to be set up yeah so that um, it's nice because when you put your quilt top on in clear view you're going to have a flat surface with no pole yep. on the top see this is it would come up over the top like that it comes so up it's over really nice top. for ruler work mm -hmm. um, it's nice for micro quilting yep. any any time that you don't want that extra bar blocking your way yeah exactly so then some people say well why do i not leave it in clear view all the time you so sure can. <laughs> you can, um, but with Clearview, 
it is a little bit trickier to get mm -hmm. to the bobbin area yep. of your machine when you've got your your quilt loaded. If you stop so. and you if you stop in the middle of quilting and you've got batting hanging down here, you will need to be sure and bring your machine over to the side to yep. be able to access that bobbin case. But once again, that's an easy problem to deal with. <laughs> yeah. So, so they they will have their pros and their cons. Yep. Exactly. So find what works. Yep, exactly. I usually load in Clearview. I know that Christina actually does kind of a combination just depending on what she's doing. Uh, so just pick your favorite. And for the Moxie, for the loft frame, there's you can actually set it up in high or low, which corresponds with what we've been talking about. So it's not um, the quick change. The, the change between the two is a little bit different. It's not a quick change. You actually have to unscrew those side brackets and move them that you absolutely can. Now, one thing to note on any of these, if you load it in clear view, it's in clear view all the way through that quilt. You can't swap halfway through. Correct. So whatever you start with is what you're stuck with for that specific quilt. When you get done with that quilt, you can always swap it and do something different. So, okay, let's talk about a couple of other things with maintenance. So one thing that's important actually with the machine is to keep it dusted and clean too. And you want to run your fingers along the thread path. Um, I usually do this, I don't know, maybe a couple times a year. I don't necessarily do this every time I clean, but make sure that you're not uh, wearing any grooves or a little burr has formed or something like that along your thread path. That could always cause thread breaks. You wanna keep everything clean and smooth. Uh, your two tension discs, Sometimes you might wanna take a piece of paper and run it up through to the two tension discs, especially if you've been using really linty thread because you can get some lint up there, can't you? Yeah. Which, yeah, once again, we don't want. So be sure to clean that thread path often. And let's show you a couple of other things that we need to do to maintain. So a really important thing is to be able to change your foot, first yes. of all. So all of our machines actually come with two feet. I'm gonna grab my little 2.5 millimeter hex wrench. And right now on this machine, we actually have the glide foot, which is a, a foot that you can purchase. This is not one that comes with your machine. Um, we love using this foot though for free motion when you're quilting with your pro stitcher. So to change your foot, it's, it's pretty simple, isn't it? It is. So I'm just gonna use my 2.5 millimeter hex and I'm gonna loosen the screw right here. Now, I don't have to unscrew it all the way. I just have to unscrew it enough so that I can get a little movement on that foot. And note that I can actually pull up on this needle bar and hop to be able to pull that down and then easily pull it out. So Christina and I are gonna make a quick switch here. I'm gonna put back on, this is our hopping foot or our ruler foot, as we call it. This is the foot that comes with your machine, as a matter of fact, when you get your machine, mm -hmm. this is the foot that's on there. Correct. And I'll just tighten this back up. So it's as simple as that to change your feet. Yep. And depending on which machine you have, the mm -hmm. orientation might be different, right. but it's the same concept. Yep. And also, um, just a side note, if you're using one of the plastic feet, like the glide foot that mm -hmm. we had on earlier, don't tighten that screw super, super, super tight. tight. Yeah. Um, you just want it to be tight enough that the foot's staying on, but yeah. you don't want to crack that plastic. Exactly, exactly. With the metal ones, you can be a little more aggressive. Okay. Um, the next thing that we recommend for maintaining your machine is to change your needle. How often do we change our needle? Every quilt. Every quilt deserves a new needle. That's what we like to say. Unless it's a baby <laughs> quilt, then you could yeah. do a few of those. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> those smaller projects, it's not a problem. So we have... Okay, so here's a package of needles that we've got here, and our system is the 134. So right up here at the top, it says the 134. That is the right size of needle to use for our machines. And then the size of the needle is right over here. It says 90 slash 14. So the 14 is the number, that second number that's usually in the teens it are the numbers that we refer to. So this is a size 14. And then down here is an R. And the R is for a sharp needle, because R totally stands for the sharp. word sharp. <laughs> so to change a needle, uh, what we do is we loosen this thumb, thumb screw right up here. So not the one that the foot was on, no, but the not other this one. bar. On the other side, it's a little thumb screw, and you may need to 
Use that 2.5 millimeter hex wrench again, and just loosen it a little. And then your needle will slide right out. And I always just like to poke it into my leader, let it sit there for a minute. Yeah, I like to not poke it towards me because I tend to stab myself. <laughs> You're braver than I am. I, you know what? I think it's because maybe it's because I do it in clear. I don't know. <laughs> I probably do usually stab myself. I just don't realize it. Okay. So I'm going to take my new needle and put it in here with the long groove to the front. Then I'm going to take my old needle and actually put it right in that, the hole of the needle. And I can use that to turn the needle and get it nice and straight. And then I will just tight hand tighten the thumb screw. And then I will use my hex wrench to tighten it just a quarter of a turn. You don't need to tighten it much. You don't want to tighten it too much. You might accidentally strip out your uh, thumb screw. You want to be careful with that. So needle is all the way up. All the way up. As far as it'll go. Yep. Long skinny groove down the front. Yep. You can run your finger now down it. The cutout is at the back. The scarf is to the back. Exactly. And so your needle hole, the eye of the needle is facing straight forward which sometimes we'll refer to as six o'clock. Yep. Because sometimes we talk about turning the needle a little bit and using that time clock, the dials of the clock yep. is helpful. So exactly. think about six o'clock. Okay, and look at that, I even got it threaded. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty brave, huh? <laughs> much better than I've been doing today. <laughs> so we've gotten that part done now. Um, let's talk about the last part of maintenance. So you guys can see that I've, we've got a bunch of light here down in the bobbin area. So let's take a look here at the bobbin case and how to put our bobbin in properly. Your bobbin area in the Amara, and you can see that there's a little bit of lint and stuff there. There's two different ways to clean. You can either use a brush or you can use canned air. On the Amara, you can use the canned air because it's got this baffle, this black part here in the back. So I'm just gonna do a couple of short bursts of air, holding the can really nice and straight. And then we want to do our one drop of oil. So I'm just going to use the oiler and it just goes right there in the little lip. You put your bobbin in so that it will turn clockwise. We'll put it, the thread goes down through the little slot and then up behind the spring. It goes in this way with this little notch up at the top and we just snap it right in there. So it makes a nice little click and then your bobbin's ready to go. Okay, so we took a close look at the Amara case here. Now, we have a couple of little details to talk about here. So you guys noticed in the back of the Amara bobbin area, I pointed out the the baffle that's at the back, the, the divider, the divider, the blocker. Yeah. All sorts of words. So those are only in the Forte, the Amara, the Infinity, and the Moxie. Those are the machines that you can use canned air to clean your bobbin area. The rest of our machines, help me out here, okay. HQ-16. Probably the original 16. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the original 16, the Sweet 16. Sweet 16. Capri. Capri. Avante. Avante. Fusion. Fusion. I think that's it. Simply 16. Simply 16. All of those do not have that little extra piece of plastic in the back, which means that if we used canned air, we'd be blowing all that back into the machine. Not a good idea. So you only want to clean those bobbin cases with a brush, right? Exactly. And, and not just the bobbin case, but the whole bobbin hook area. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Not the yeah, bobbin case. So that's, I think that's everything. Oh, there was one other thing we wanted to talk about. So when you get your new frame set up, you'll have leaders that go from end to end. And depending on if you get a 10 foot, 10 foot frame, your leaders are actually going to be a little long and you'll need to cut them down so that they're of the appropriate size. You'll uh, serge or zigzag the edges and then you'll have leaders that are the right size. But you guys will notice on the frame we have set up here, we actually have shorter leaders, don't we? We do, yep. So a great addition to your, your new frame is to actually buy a second set of leaders. You can see those are cut shorter there. Um, you can buy a second set of leaders and you can actually cut them down into shorter sizes. That way you have multiple sets of leaders because we can Velcro them on and off. Mm -hmm. That way you can have a project that goes on and off, on and off. <laughs> We do this often. Yes. It's great to just have that extra set. So that's that's another little something extra that you can be sure and add you can add to your frame. I, so. Another reason why I like that extra set is because if I'm doing a lot of small quilts mm -hmm. 
and I'm using my full liters, I've got all that extra flap on the ends, yes. which is okay. I can deal with that. Yeah. But I'm putting all of that pressure in on the, the middle section of that leader mm -hmm. as I'm tightening those baby quilts. Yeah. And it will, over time, stretch and distort that leader. Yep. And we don't want distorted leaders. No. So I like no. to have smaller leaders for my smaller projects. Exactly. Larger leaders for my larger projects. Exactly. And one major tip for leaders, don't wash them. Yeah, never. Don't wash them. They <laughs> will, these are 100% cotton canvas and the Velcro is not cotton, which means that when you wash them, things are gonna shrink and not shrink and then they're not gonna be flat and straight. So, so just don't wash them. If yeah. they get to the point where they're filthy, you just can't handle it anymore, just get a new set. Time for a new set. Yep. Time for a um, new set. We also didn't talk about the super leader. Oh, right. So this is the super leader. Which and we can it pull is out here. 10 inches longer yep. than the regular leader. So Let's if you have a out. studio frame, mm -hmm. you will get just a regular leader on the back. If you have a gallery frame, it comes standard with this super leader yep. on the top. Yep. So if you notice, when Kim's got that pulled all the way forward, the super leader, this is a studio frame. Yep. It's almost all the way to that front pole. Yep. So you're not leaning over to pin. Yeah. So that's also a great addition. Yeah. And, and if you do have a gallery frame, you definitely want to have the super leader yeah. on it. So. Yeah. Be sure to put your super leader on the take up pole. Yes. That's the moral of the story yeah. there, right? I mean, you could be wild and crazy and buy a whole bunch of super leaders and put them on all your poles, you but could. I don't know you why. You could, but <laughs> pinning is a little easier on the shorter ones here at the front, but on the back, it's definitely to your advantage to have that longer leader. Bring it a little closer to you. Yep. So, all right. Can we add one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. What else do you have to add? What about when we're not using the machine? Oh. How do we turn off the machine yes, the proper way yes, and how yes. do we take care of, take care of everything so the the amara we have set up here has a pro stitcher on it remember when you have a pro stitcher you always want to shut down the pro stitcher first so we go to we choose the file tab then we choose shut down on the ribbon and choose shut down and my tablet is going to turn off so once your tablet has shut down um, you'll go to the you'll turn off your machine and the best way to turn off your machine is actually from the back so you flip off the button at the back and then it's really important to make sure that you unplug your machine when you're not using it. So be sure to do that every time. And I'm trying to think, we've got that. Oh, and then Christina so, actually has something extra yeah. that she does that so, she wants So not to only about. unplug the machine, but actually, if some people will say have it like in a, a power protector yeah. and they think that that's sufficient. No, unplug it completely. Yep from the wall you do not want to have it attached no nope. at all no nope. um that will void your warranty if there happens to be a thunderstorm these machines cost a fair amount of they're, money they're so investment. you want to protect them so exactly. just take that two seconds unplug it from unplug the wall. it when you're okay. not using it when yeah. you're not yeah. when it's turned off and you're not using it yep. um and then let's talk about keeping your machine covered if you're if you're a weekend warrior quilter like I am. I usually only have time to actually quilt in my own studio on the weekends. Uh, it's a really good idea to actually keep your machine covered, just like we keep our domestic machines covered. So, uh, but Christy, I know, like, what do you usually use? <laughs> Super <I> use, fancy. <laughs> yeah, I'm real high class here. I use a fitted twin size sheet. Oh, nice. That has a print on it that uh -huh. is directional. So oh. I know which way is the long way. Oh. And I also know which way's the top and which way's the bottom. Okay. So I can just grab that twin sheet uh -huh. and scrunch it up, and I know it needs to go that way. And I just take it and throw it over the machine. Okay. And it's fitted, so it kind of can cover around the, the bottom. Okay. And then I don't have to do anything else. Do it anything covers else. covers everything yeah. else and keeps the dust off the machine. Exactly. I know that there are patterns kicking around out there to uh, make covers for your machines. A lot of people, when they first get their machine, a, a bunch of that practice that you start with, you can um, trim that down and use it as a cover. I usually just grab some fabric that I have and <laughs> throw it over the top. I'm a little, I'm not as fancy as Christina, but <laughs> <A sheet>. it's <laughs> super fancy. <laughs> But it is a really good idea to keep these covered so that you don't get that um, dust and lint built up on your machines when you're not using them. So, yeah. well, hopefully that answers the questions. I think I think we, we got everything on our list. Be sure and let us know if you have any questions. Yep. Yeah. Oh, what? One more thing. What? 
Maintenance. <laughs> Maintenance. Oh, yes. Okay. So we did some extensive research because we kept hearing different things. So I actually went into every single one of the user manuals for our machines and I found out that all of our machines except the Infinity should be in service every 10 million stitches or 24 months. So that's two years. The exception, the Infinity is 15 million stitches or 24 months. So a good rule of thumb is just to take it in and get it serviced every two years, no matter what machine you have. And that's just at your local retailer. Mm -hmm. You just need to take in the machine and yep. they'll do all the, the lubing and all that stuff on the yep. inside. And the only other thing that you have to do in those two years is to actually oil yep. one drop of oil with each bobbin change. And keep everything so. clean and make lots of quilts, right? Yep. Yep. Well, hopefully you guys learned a lot of tips for taking care of your machine and that you'll enjoy having fun with it. Again, keep it nice and clean. Keep it oiled when you need yep. to. Maintain and just love it. Enjoy your quilting. <laughs>